We are very happy to have with us uh, Professor Sprut and uh, Nikki Lafis will actually introduce our speaker. Nick? It, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce Hank Spruit, a longtime collaborator and, and friend and frequent visitor of uh, uh, the University of Crete. Um, Hank uh, studied at the University of Utrecht and did uh, postdoctoral work um, first at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, and then at MPA in Garching. Uh, uh, at MPA, they liked him a lot, so immediately after his first postdoc, they offered him a permanent position, and he has been there as a senior scientist and, and, and uh, uh, later on professor of astrophysics at the University of Amsterdam until his retirement. Uh, I stress re retirement, not uh, resigning from work <laughs> or research. <laughs> I'll come to that. Um, he um, um, was honored with the he Heinz Meyer Leibniz Prize. For, yeah. He was honored with the Heinz Meyer Leibniz Prize for early career science. And he also received the George Ellery Hale Prize for solar physics. Uh, from the American Astronomical Society. Uh, he has worked on solar physics. I will mention a few. He worked on accretion onto neutron stars and black holes, jets, uh, uh, dynamo mechanisms for magnetic field, MHD problems, uh, um, uh, GRBs, radiative transfer, and many others. So for his retirement, uh, he started working on a new topic and um, uh, he will talk to us about it today, the formation of very slowly rotating stars. Hank. Yeah, thank you very much, Nick, for this nice introduction. Yeah, a slowly rotating star. What do I mean by slowly rotating? I mean real slow. Think, say, decades, uh, possibly even centuries, rotation periods of that order. Um, is the connection good enough for me to be audible? Yes. Yes, we can hear you just fine. Okay, good. So um, after long thought, I've been thinking about this question. You might think, well, geez, there's so many funny things. Uh, what's so special about a star rotating that slow? Well, it turns out that anything you try turns out to have real problems. Um, so the title of my talk actually gives away the punchline. I think it has to do with conditions during star formation. Now that at first sight is, uh, looks like a rather uh, heretic way of looking at it. And I'll try to f convince you that it is still, I think, the best possible way of explaining this. Um, so the idea is then um, that if this is in the diet, that, that uh, is really the case, that it has to do with star formation, and it may, may actually give us clues about uh, processes taking place during star formation. So I'll come to that in a minute. But first, something about rotation in general. The sun, the sun rotates, and it can be observed in amazing detail. In this case here, it is the uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory, which has been running for almost 15 years now. It makes the nicest pictures of the sun so far. What you're seeing here is a picture of the sun's magnetic field. Um, but, uh, better said, the normal component to the surface, white towards us and black uh, into the sun or the, right, the, other, the other way around, <clears throat> measured with the um, Doppler. Uh, Michelson interferometer on SDO. And if you just follow this for a month or so, the jerkiness is just a transmission here. So what you can see, if you look at this clearly in, long enough, you'll see all sorts of interesting things happening, sunspots forming and decaying again. Um, new active regions con uh, being brought up from the surf, from below. 
Anyway, so this is one of the nicest examples of what can be done these days about magnetic fields of the sun. Um, this is a movie of what you would see in, in uh, white light, in ordinary uh, white light, if a sunspot group appears on the surface. So it follows the rotation, this uh, movie follows the rotation of the sun. And at some point you see here a new active region forming. All sorts of magnetic fields appear at the surface. They sort themselves out into groups of spots. And all the while the sun is, continues to rotate, taking this new group of sunspots to the west limb. It is that kind of um, modulation of the brightness of the sun that becomes visible uh, just photometrically. And for stars other than the sun, um, now that with space instruments, you can detect really very small variations, photometric variations in stars. This is a way in which rotation has been measured for a very large number of solar type stars. It can also be done from the ground. Um, so how do we measure rotation more in general, there's of course the Doppler broadening of spectral lines. That turns out for most of what I'm going to say is a bit useless because it only works if the rotation is sufficiently fast and I'm interested in slow rotation. So what's left then is brightness variations due to, due to spots. Those give us an, us an idea of how fast a star rotates. But for this to happen, you have to have a star with a convective envelope because those are the ones that are known to produce magnetic fields that vary in time, like the sun. Um, and then you can look at these stars up to the length of your observing run um, and deter determine a rotation period, for example, also for a whole group of stars. Like, for example, here, <coughs> um, the um, a paper by the Nesenkov et al, where they looked at the distribution of rotation periods for clusters of stars, all the way from a few million years to here, for AP, I guess, and a number in between. Now, if you look at this diagram, what is the first thing that you that you that strikes you? The first thing that strikes me is this enormous scatter in rotation periods. Does it really make sense to fit any kind of mean curve through them? Shouldn't you start with actually looking at what causes this enormous variation in rotation periods? Um, so this was for different uh, clusters. If you look, for example, at one of them in more detail, um, uh, surprise OB, uh, one of the, the clumps there. Um, and you see, you can now see this uh, rotation as a function of spectral type or here, mass of the star, M type stars here. <clears throat> and there is a whole, a whole range of periods from less than a day, uh, something like a third of a day or a quarter of a day, all the way up to the limit of the observations that was 15 days. So this actually calls for extended observations to see how this uh, diagram continues to larger periods. Um, so this was one cluster where you have an idea of what the age is. Uh, let's now look at older stars, field stars. There's a nice paper here by um, Newton et al. for a field of southern in the southern sky where you have the same range of masses plotted or significant fraction of the same range of masses plotted. And you know, this diagram here for a, for a young cluster, that this lump here between one and 10 days, that has somehow split up into one group with rotation periods of 100 days, and the other sunk down to even faster rotation. Curious. <clears throat> 
Um, so this was just to give you an idea of the degree of, of, of strangeness that you see happening in the organization of stars. But this is still nothing compared to the, to the so-called AP stars. This is a, a spectral classification, um, uh, at least a century old, <clears throat> where the P stands for chemically peculiar. These are stars that have a, a weird spectrum in which you see all sorts of elements that shouldn't be visible at all because of their low abundance. These are stars that are hot, hotter than the sun uh, from 1.5 solar masses upwards. Uh, and they have no convective envelope anymore. Main sequence stars. Um, so they have, because they don't have a convective envelope, which we believe is necessary for producing a dynamo and sunspots, it has, they have no spots like the sun. However, they have something else. They have these weird abundances all the way to things like europium and neodymium. Okay. Um, and the, the next thing that's peculiar is that these strange abundances are local. There are spots of them on this star. And as it rotates, you see different, or different clumps of different groups of elements appearing and disappearing again. And they're all magnetic. Now that makes sense because there is absolutely no reason why these elements, these rare elements, which should be in the atmosphere in the first place, they would just sink down or be mixed by whatever slow process is, is happening. These stars are old, 100 million years or more. Uh, plenty of time for all these elements to settle down. They didn't do that because these are elements that have lots of lines in their spectrum, especially in the near UV where these A stars have their maximum uh, contribution to their volumetric light. So it is the upward lifting of these elements by radiative pressure. But that would still not explain why they stick into clumps on the surface or spots at least on the surface. And that's why the magnetic field comes in. The magnetic field keeps these abundance spots in place. Now, uh, if this sounds far-fetched to, to you, it is a well-developed theory, developed theory. It's been around for decades already. And with time, it has only become better. It's just difficult because you have to do the uh, radiative transfer for these very complicated spectra. Now, knowing what, what's, what, what is probably behind it, let's go back to the observations. Um, we don't know if any of them really rotate long, longer than a century because these spectra, the first time such spectra could be made was early last century. But they were already found at that time. Some of them were really bright stars, like for example, the star Aliot, the brightest star in the Big Dipper is one. And then there's a very funny star called Gamma uh, Equulei uh, that has been observed for almost 100 years. Uh, let me show you the distribution of these rotation period, periods. So this is a bit strange uh, units, but log, log, log P in days. Um, so this one here is called CO Virginis. <clears throat> That's the fastest rotating one. It rotates with half a day. And these are also pretty fast, less than 10 days. Um, but then there are a few. For example, this little blue one called Gamma Eculi, the, the third star in Eculius on the uh, rather inconspicuous um, constellation. And it ha this happened to have been, been observed for almost a century. And one has seen this very slow change of the, of the uh, abundance patterns on the surface in the course of this, of this, uh, this uh, century. And then there are lots of triangles here. Well, those are stars that have only lower limits on their rotation periods. And as you can see, this, is, this gets into years 
uh, will take quite a while before these become any better because you would have to wait for decades to see these things move to the right. So this is more or less an observational uh, problem. The, the sheer length of these, are, uh, of these periods um, confines you more or less to stars that have been seen to the brightest stars that are in the sample. So here in the vertical scale, the uh, magnetic field strength goes all the way from, I think a few hundred for Aliot, all the way up to 30,000. There are, I think, two of them. I forgot the names now. Okay, so another question is, how do you spin down a star? Stars are born rapidly rotating in a circular Sanyayev disk, for example. How do you spin it down? Well, there are various proposals here. One of them is stellar wind. If this star uh, loses angular momentum in a, in a wind uh, like the sun does, then couldn't that spin the star down to very long periods? And just to show um, what a stellar wind looks like, here is the stellar wind of the sun, the solar wind, seen with uh, SOHO satellite LASCO instrument. Um, there is here a stick that blocks most of the light of the sun, so you see only the corona. Now this is of course faster played back. Um, I think it's like each of these blobs moving out is, takes about a day. And if some of these blobs actually point at us, then they cause magnetic storms, geomagnetic storms. Like this one, for example. Here's Venus coming in. Okay, so this is the sort of observational material we have about stellar winds being, uh, being produced by a star like the sun. Who's that? Is that me? I need to switch that off. Okay. okay. Um, now, of course, it then comes down to um, details of this process. And you'll find that it doesn't nearly come as close as breaking, as, as spinning the star down to, to years. And we have much longer periods. So that gets rid of one possibility. There are two more. Um, maybe I should just skip to what has been discussed to some extent uh, for several decades now, the disk locking mechanism. Yeah, disk locking. Yeah. Um, the idea is that these stars, if, as, as long as they rotate uh, rapidly or reasonable rotation rates, they have a strong magnetic field on the order of a kilogauss on their surface. And this magnetic field, to some extent, interferes with the mass that's being accreted on it. So as a result, it has a magnetosphere, a volume in which this magnetic field dominates. And outside it, you have the accretion disk uh, supplying mass to it. Now, at the boundary between the two, you have interaction. There's a friction taking place. If the star rotates against some, something that orbits slower, then the star will add angular momentum back to the accretion disk. So that's one way um, in which you can, uh, could explain this. And again, it has the problem that it, can, it comes nowhere close to ro rotation periods as long as we, um, we actually see in the stars. So that was that. Um, then, then what's left, uh, as in the case of Sherlock Holmes, what's left <laughs> after the impossible has removed what's left, <clears throat> even how uh, even if very unlikely must have been uh, the solution. So that's the, uh, the take I'm ta making. Namely that slowly rotating stars must have been born while avoiding accretion of angular momentum. So how can that happen? Well, during star formation, there's also a magnetic field around. 
the cloud's magnetic field and it has a huge amount of magnetic flux. That magnetic flux gets somehow left behind during accretion, but who knows if a little bit of it remains left and connected to the star, then there's a direct magnetic connection from the star to something further out. It doesn't have to be very far, in fact. And there would be a magnetic torque that can be transmitted between this cloud and the star. Um, from your observational point of view, you say immediately, well, that, that cannot be the case because we also see stars that rotate uh, quickly. Uh, so the issue is more, how often does this happen? I think it happens in some cases. In the most clear cases, it must have happened this way. Now, this is all not very new, in fact. In the 50s, or actually, I should say, in uh, 1965, and this is not the first time it was mentioned, but there's a paper by Leon Mestel, um, who pointed it out that, you know, as long as the field can retain a suitable structure, it can transport angular momentum away from central condensation. And this might be the process that was, I think in that time was all already seen as a possible mechanism of uh, getting the star rotating slower. Um, where are we, Lee? Yes. So let's take a step back and look at two connected problems. We have the angular momentum problem. We want to get, for these particular stars, you want to get the angular momentum away completely. Yeah? Um, is that possible? And the second problem is the magnetic flux problem. This, the amount of magnetic flux that's involved in the formation of a star, starting at, say, a tenth of a parsec at one kilometer per second orbital velocity, you'll find that the angular momentum, specific angular momentum per unit mass, is 10,000 times larger than in the stars that are finally formed. It's not enough to just remove 99% of the angular momentum. You have to do it to one part in 10,000. And the similar, uh, similar thing happens with the, ma the magnetic flux. Magnetic flux at these distances, say, a uh, milligauss field at tenth of a parsec or so um, contains a million times more magnetic flux than you see in magnetic stars. With a large, was it a million or a hundred, a hundred thousand times? So there's, there is there um, five decades. Um, so the conclusion is that both must have lost, have been lost. And then the question is, which disappears first? Um, I made a little intermezzo so I can bring up this picture which I have advertised. Um, this is the famous um, B213 image from Herschel, uh, where one also knows the magnetic field orientations from the radio observations and the velocities mass flows down into this filament, as it is called. And in these filaments, you can have clumps. And in the clumps, you have star formation. So that is this kind of picture that was a, uh, that you infer from pictures like this and the associated radio data. <clears throat> the mass is still in the process. In this particular case, this is already a somewhat advanced um, stage where the magnetic field passes, still passes through the filament. Um, and there's still some mass raining down. This is magnetic, it must be magnetically dominated region, but there's still some mass flowing down into these clumps. I think this is more or less consistent with what people have uh, used as interpretation of these data also. So we have this problem of, of two connected um, problems to be explained. And the current default view, if you talk to the standard view you would be taught in the class about star formation, then it, for it, the assumption is that the magnetic flux first disappears. 
And then during momentum that's left, will form an accretion disk. And this accretion disk by, by the, the physics of such accretion disks can leave the magnetic field behind while the, the, uh, the angular momentum uh, can leave the angular momentum, sorry, they can leave the angular momentum be behind while the mass accretes inward. And the angular momentum that's left is, the, is left in the cloud some, some way or another. Now this, this picture must be fairly good for some of the stars, some of the very rapidly rotating stars, for example. Even if they had left, they left almost all angular momentum behind, they apparently still have enough lot left to keep the star rotate, the, the newly formed star rapidly rotating. But as you have seen in the examples I showed, this cannot be the, the norm because there are only a few that rotate so fast. So something in between seems to happen for most stars. So that suggests that these problems of magnetic flux that has to disappear and momentum has to disappear somehow both play a role in most stars that are still forming. Um, Magnetic field can also be, okay, do, do, but how, do, do, how does magnetic field leave the star while it's accreting? Uh, one of the suggest suggestions is, is that ambipolar diffusion uh, will take care of it. Ambipolar diffusion is the drift of neutral um, atoms with respect to ions. The ions and the electrons together uh, are, t are, are kept um, tied to the magnetic field and the neutrals can flow between the, uh, the ions uh, and accrete. Um, now that is fine and people have done all sorts of calculations that show this process, but it cannot work in the inner regions of the, of the accretion process. Remember we have a factor of 100,000 to cover inefficiency of leaving, uh, leaving magnetic fields behind. If there's only 10 to the minus three of the original flux that conserved in the later stages, then it would be still a hundred times too much to explain uh, observed magnetic fields. And of course it conflicts with the fact that there's some stars that apparently have been able to leave the magnetic field, um, have not been able, uh, have the, um, with these, the very slow rotation as well. Okay, I'm just going ahead of myself a little bit. Um, good. So the alternative would be that some stars form with continued connection with their birth cloud. That's the alternative that I propose. And um, exactly why some do this and others not is yet an issue to be discussed. But the idea is old. I already mentioned Nestel, 1965. Um, there's a fairly recent calculation by Colin Mizano and Allen, um, where they let, they construct a um, sort of toy model of a, of a collapsing cloud with a magnetic field in it. Um, and you do this in such a way that there is still some magnetic connection left in the process. And they come to the conclusion that if they follow this up, this, uh, this model, then eventually the star doesn't rotate, that forms will not rotate at all. And they conclude from this that dissipation of essential magnetic fields is a fundamental requisite for the formation of proton planetary disks. And I would go ahead a little bit and saying, well, maybe not all of them do it this way. In the literature, this is called the magnetic breaking catastrophe. Um, in some numerical simulations, one actually sees this kind of connection happening in front of one's eyes because they do not seem to follow the accretion disks that have to be there or not, not often enough. This is called a catastrophe. And that illustrates the 
the, uh, the emphasis on this um, standard view of Shakura's Nyaya physics. And solutions have been proposed. Like here is a, a solution uh, which I haven't read in detail that early disk uh, formation uh, can avoid like, the, br the breaking catastrophe. And then there are people who say that their way of doing the, um, um, the ambipolar diffusion means that there is in fact no, no such breaking catastrophe. That if you do things right, then there will be no breaking catastrophe. So this is uh, a summary of this uh, paper by Kali Zano and Shu. Um, two versions of it. There was a, what you might call it, uh, an erratum here, uh, where they apparently had changed the sign of the magnetic field that was necessary. Um, well, I, I may come back to this because that issue also plays a role in my own model. Could we still have to explain this kind of diagram? Yes, there it is. But let's now <clears throat> look at what kind of observational data there is. And there are funny things happening in the sky. For example, this paper here, first of these two, um, plots the rotation velocity, uh, the velocity they see, the rotational velocity, as a function of distance, or rather the other way around, distance versus velocity signal. And here, at large distances, uh, the rotation follows, you know, sort of follows a, a Keplerian curve, these dashed lines. But inside 50 AU, that stops to be the case. Our rotation goes down. This is a surprise. Um, another one here is a paper by uh, Imai and Val, um, where they see infalling velocities and barely uh, any uh, Keplerian motion. And they conclude that if there's any Keplerian motion, it must be inside about 5 AU. So there are these, these funny things happening. And I would like to see them as evidence that not all stars actually uh, maintain uh, a rapid rotation during their formation. That uh, there must be stars that are kept slowly rotating, protostars that are kept slowly rotating by their connection with the Earth cloud. So this is now a little bit about my model. I don't have to say too much. Um, in, uh, instead of uh, um, Shu's model, uh, Kali et al. Um, model, um, I'm using a model in which the magnetic flux is not completely lost, so that the magnetic fields plays a role in the accretion um, in the form of a magnetically supported disk. That is a disk in which some of the rotation uh, is reduced because a magnetic field, magnetic tension, supports the disk in part against gravity. So that is this, this uh, little formula here. Normally, you would equate the rotation, the Keplerian rotation, with the gravity of the central star. And there is now a correction because some of the uh, support against gravity is by a magnetic field. Now, I don't have to say more about it, but it is basically a picture of what it might look like. You have these clumps of mass flowing through, through the magnetic field, okay, gravity pointing in, and somehow mass flows across these field lines. Now that can of course be done by ambipolar diffusion, but that's not the only way. Um, so how do we get from such a picture a very slow rotation, these enormously long rotation periods? Well, you have to remember that the amount of angular momentum involved is absolutely negligible. So if you have any ingredient that acts like it extracts angular momentum, there is no problem whatsoever to get a zero rotation or very long periods. For example, if the amount of angular momentum you need to lose to change the period of a star from 10 days to 20 days, then that same amount is enough to spin it 
completely from 20 days to infinity. So this just illustrates that thinking in terms of the periods as extreme, it may be uh, um, a bit misleading uh, as long as there is a connection that transfers angular momentum. And that's what the magnetic, magnetic field does. So how much would you need, for example, if you had a star um, that has still some connection or uh, sorry, an accretion disk, uh, uh, what you call it, uh, um, partially supported by magnetic fields um, that is still connected to something, uh, some magnetic field at the distance of, let's say, Neptune, 30 AU. That's pretty close in. Uh, but still, such a magnetic connection could spin you down to the period, the orbital period of Neptune, if that's what the magnetic field does. If it rotates like Neptune around at the distance of Neptune, then the, uh, the star could in principle lose its angular momentum to that orbital period, 160 years. So these questions of how you lose this angular momentum that you need to lose to get to these very long, long periods actually can already be settled, can, can be settled already very close to the star. Um, okay, now something about how you would uh, maintain this uh, magnetic, keep this magnetic field um, that maintains the connection between the cloud and the star, that is this cloud and the forming star. One is the ambipolar diffusion, where it's only in low ionization regions, and then these closer orders of magnitude that we have to cover, you need something else. And that is known, a magnetic really Taylor instability. That it is not discussed very much, in, but in this context, but it is by far the most efficient way of make, making mass flow across field lines. And to convince you, I have here uh, an example from solar physics. In solar physics, you can see this magnetic really Taylor instability happening in front of your eyes. Uh, that's this little movie here. This is a movie made by an amateur astronomer with an H alpha filter and uh, an occulting disk. So we have here the sun, or rather the occulting disk that blocks most of the light. And outside it, you have the magnetic, you have the mass that radiates as H alpha emission. And in a, in a solar eclipse, you can see it as these nice red blobs around the, around the moon. Um, and this has a temperature, uh, H alpha temperature, say 10,000 10, degrees. Um, and that is dead cold compared to the gravitational potential here. It would drop down to 100 kilometers per second uh, flow speed. Instead, it does something like this. Now this is a movie over uh, probably a couple of hours of data. We we'll just see that these the things happening here, for example. You see white stuff dropping down. And in between, you see dark stuff moving up. Now, what is this? The bright stuff is the H alpha emitting gas. And the dark stuff, yeah, what is that? Well, it's matter that is not, um, it's matter that does not radiate in, uh, in H alpha. It would be field free magnetic field that's pushing up. So how does this look like if we sketch the magnetic field that goes with it? Um, if we look at the, um, this prominence from the side, so then we see something like this. And it is material that is suspended by this magnetic field configuration. Magnetic tension at this kink here is what keep this, keeps this matter suspended above the surface of the sun. If I rotate this by 90 degrees so I can see it face on, then you see what you saw in this movie, mass moving, uh, magnetic fields moving up and uh, mass flowing down and eventually raining down to the photosphere. So we can, once we know that this can happen, let's now apply it to 
uh, an accretion disk. We only, the only thing we need to do is just rotate the picture by 90 degrees, so gravity is, to, is, is, is horizontal in this case. My, my central mass here, magnetic fields being held in place by an accretion disk, um, somewhat like the picture I had already shown. No, just like in the case of the solar prominence, one expects, uh, you know, by linear stability theory, for example, that the um, process will cause a matter to flow this way while magnetic field, sorry, magnetic field move this way while matter accretes. And it would be, or it would look like this if you look at it from the top. You look at it down, then here would be this last field line here, and the mass would try to, to flow in. And it does that by forming these fingers. Magnetic flux moves out and gas moves in. These are things which can be calculated in, in reasonably good detail. So that's what I hope is the case also in these denser regions where a bipolar doesn't work anymore. Uh, just by purely ideal MHD instability. So then, of course, to, in order to make this work for a model, you need some kind of parameterizations. So for the calculations that I've done, I've just assumed that this mass flow speed uh, is scales with the free fall speed at some small fraction of it. Now, why, why, why would we do this? Um, something similar, something of, uh, that's useful for this discussion is shown here. Um, this, is, uh, this is work by my former student, uh, Rudi Stele, um, where we had set up a calculation in two dimensions, a plane in which mass rotates here, and a magnetic field feeding through it, um, but with a simplification. The calculation is two-dimensional in the plane and three-dimensional in the magnetic field, but we make use of the fact that above the disk, the magnetic field dominates everything, at least close to the surface of the disk, magnetic field dominates, and that means if it's the only thing that has forces, that the for magnetic field has to, have, has, has to be force-free, or in our case, a potential field. Now, potential fields you can do with applied mathematical comp uh, computations. Um, <clears throat> so you, you reduce in this way this three-dimensional configuration to a two-dimensional one. All the flows take place in the horizontal plane. So this is what, how it develops. The instability sets in here near the center, and then it grows into blob blobs of various kinds. So we know from this somewhat simplified case that this instability actually is there and it could be useful. So um, what I envisage now is that uh, in order to cover this large range in length scales, it is normal to assume that you don't have just one clump, but the clump break, uh, breaks up into smaller clumps. Um, I'm now assuming that this process of smaller and smaller scales is sort of the same on every scale, that the same assumptions can be made on every, every scale. That means you use a self-similar or scale-free model. So I won't go through the calculations in any detail. Let me just um, give you here the assumptions that go in, into it. So the range of length scales of a factor of 10 to the five or more is done by assuming that the whole process is scale-free in the sense that it can be applied to any of these orders of magnitude in between. Basically the same process happening at different amplitudes. Uh, the, the disk in it is partially supported by gravity, supported by magnetic fields, and this causes it to rotate subcaplarian because the force of gravity has been reduced by the magnetic field. Then there's mass transport across the magnetic field by this interchange instability, and at the same time, 
I allow for a connection of this, this potential field out in the, at, until some distance. Uh, how, how large a distance determines how well the material will be, how well the coupling will be. And we assume that this, uh, this connection to the cloud by some of the magnetic field lines actually extending out uh, could transmit a torque that acts on the air creation disk and uh, on basically on the pseudo disk is what you call it and uh, allows mass to accrete. So um, that is how it's done. So the scaling here is uh, very similar to what you have in hydrodynamical accretion disks. Velocities, all velocity scalars are to the minus one half distance from this from this central object to the minus a half. Gas density minus three halves, and uh, finally magnetic field strength, which you have to assume goes as minus two half fourth. For this kind of magnetic field, there are in fact very nice analytical solutions for this in the form of the magnetic field. So that's then the equations, your balance equation, uh, the surface density times acceleration of gravity corrected for by rotation plus magnetic tension uh, vanished. We are assuming that this is an, an equilibrium. And momentum being transported is also assumed to be steady. Uh, and then there is the attraction of angular momentum here and the, uh, the stress exerted by the magnetic field. Those two has to compensate each other as well. So we calculate this from a notional outer edge of the disk and see how, it, if, how its rotation will evolve under this equation. Uh, the, uh, there, there's a, we have put in a formula, formula for the connection to the cloud and that uh, reflects itself into a stress acting on the, on the disk. And that will change the rotation as a function of radius. So this is a stationary calculation, okay? Um, we want to see how mass will change its rotation as it drifts inward. And the result is um, interesting, namely that the uh, presence of a magne magnetic torque leads to a bifurcation in the solutions for this problem. Either if you start with at the outer edge with a rotation close to Keplerian, then rotations, rotation then remains near Keplerian, just like in a, a standard Shakuris and Gaia disks, except in this case with some support by magnetic fields. But if you start only a little bit below Keplerian rotation, the magnetic field is sufficiently strong to be just a little bit below magnetic. Uh, Keplerian rotation supported um, magnetic fields supporting against uh, rotation. Then the, the angular momentum loss in this umbilical that connects to the cloud accelerates until the rotation matches that of the cloud. In other words, zero rotation if the cloud is sufficiently far away. So here's, for example, some of these uh, examples. This is the rotation as a function of distance as the mass moves inward. For different values of the starting rotation speed, rotation period. One is here uh, in units that I'm using. Okay, one is the Keplerian rotation, sorry. Then if I vary the amount of rotation at this point a little bit, I see this bifurcation process happening. If I reduce the um, initial rotation to a value of 0.8, I get this curve, and within a factor of 10 in radius, all the, all the rotation has gone. If I don't make it as, as extreme as that, for example, if I take um, here, the opposite case would be if the, ro the initial rotation is closer to Keplerian, then eventually it will completely become a Keplerian disk, at which point I have to stop for technical reasons. And in between you have these two cases, uh, very closely separated by small differences in the initial rotation. You can also plot this as a function of 
uh, rotation in, in, in units of the Keplerian rotation, get this kind of diagram. So these are what you call it, but they're just a little bit better than toy models, okay? But they show you that the presence of, uh, of, of a remnant of the cloud's magnetic field could well be sufficient to make, keep the star uh, from accreting any momentum. So um, this then summarizing this bit, um, the early stage of magnetic uh, formation and magnetic accretion across the magnetic field by material that has partial support against gravity. Uh, connection to the cloud is important. It loses, get, it uh, allows the, the mass to lose its angular momentum. And the transport across the magnetic field in the disk is likely to be the Rayleigh-Taylor exchange process similar to solar prominences. Now the model uh, produces this bifurcation process, bifurcation uh, behavior. Um, let's see. So what does that mean for this kind of stars? Um, let's look, look at some open questions. Um, I think this way of thinking about it uh, makes plausible you have stars rotating very slowly, even if they're very young. But it also raises the issue of what you do with everything in between. Eh? Why is there this spread? What, what controls the in-between rotation rates between very slow and very rapid? That's an important question. So <clears throat> I've assumed that the six de decades in length scale, it, I've now increased it to, from five to six decades, that they are all similar in terms of physical processes, um, which may or may not be the case. And <clears throat> then uh, I think there's an interesting possibility that both of these processes, uh, the accretion disk case and a zero ro a rotation case can alternate uh, on the way as the mass is on the way to its final star. And um, those are things that you that were suggested already by these observations which I mentioned. Let me see if you can find it here. Um, like this one here. It starts as a Keplerian disk and then comes something else. Certainly not Keplerian disk anymore. So that's um, key. Okay, good. Uh, rotation that is uh, right, yeah. Okay, where, where was I here? Okay, observational signatures. They are already present in the, in the observations. Uh, for example, this, this question of infall or rotation, I've given you this one picture, but there are more of them. I've listed here a few and some of the statements that the authors make about in falling and rotational motions uh, being present at the same time in this in their particular source. Um, good, well, you can read this for yourself. These are interesting observational results, I think, because they point to the sort of things I, I would like to see happening. Um, what else is there? Good. Anyway, so um, I should say that I also expect uh, significant progress from the numerical simulations. Numerical simulations are, are becoming so powerful that if you write, ask the right kind of questions, you may actually get answers. Um, but that's the whole pro problem. And certainly problems like this, like star formation, you cannot just start with dumping it on the computer and get a petabyte of data and hope to see something in it. You know, and I don't think it will be possible to get better numerical results uh, or better, they're always better, but um, 
sufficiently informative numerical results if you have, don't have a clearer question. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if there are any questions from uh, the participants. You may unmute your, uh, your uh, microphone. Hello, uh, Ms. Costas, I have a question. Yeah, please, please. So I, um, I don't understand very well your, um, uh, the, the mechanism you propose by which the Rayleigh Taylor, the magnetic Rayleigh Taylor instability will transport uh, flux out and mass towards the star. Uh, my problem is uh, this, this seems to, uh, under ideal MHD conditions, this seems to contradict, right, the, 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 the fundamental concept of mass and flux moving together. Yeah. So uh, unless you have a non-ideal process to separate the two, uh, my understanding is that no instability will lead to mass and flux separation. Okay. Uh, so how do you understand, are there, you, you showed some numerical simulations, 2D numerical simulations. Have you uh, actually observed such a, 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 a relative uh, mass and flux separation in these simulations? Okay, well, um, you could, could separate it in two stages. First, you can say we'll do ideal MHD, and then we can do linear stability calculations, okay? They show just this picture uh, that the sun's uh, um, prominence shows. You find magnetic field moving out while mass moves in. Uh, but that's linear stability, of course. And that it still doesn't tell you how this, so it, 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 it's clear that this, this velocity pattern and changing magnetic field pattern uh, will happen. And you know, can do simulations that uh, you know, see, see, see this happening. Of course, then, just like in hydrodynamics, um, if you have hydrodynamic ins instability, shear instability, and you try to do this without viscosity in visit case, then you, you get perfectly uh, simulations that would seem to work perfectly well, except on the smallest scales. And just like you do in weather simulations, um, much of the uh, atmospheric uh, um, wind patterns and so on is reasonably visc free from um, molecular viscosity. It's all the turbulence that develops on smaller scales that find eventually allows these large scales to continue. And it's the same thing here. So at some point, the actual dissipation of the uh, energy that's being released in this case um, will will have an effect. But you know, just like in case you, you can hope, um, this is this is uh, somewhat of a of a tricky issue. Of course, uh, in case of normal hydrodynamics, the answer would be, oh, it doesn't matter what you do, because the cascade is always down, and you, if, it doesn't matter if you make a little mistake in this on the smallest scales okay so from that point of view you, you you should be okay but we are not completely sure if that's also the case for magnetic fields but um Hank, this is uh, my, my question is that, uh, specifically that this uh, uh you you argued that this happens un under an ideal mhd as long as there are non-ideal effects i understand it right but uh, under ideal mhd this should not be happening and if it happens uh, in simulations, then it might be because of numerical diffusion. There is always some yeah. diffusivity in small scales, right? Uh, so, but there is a way to test for that uh, with, with, uh, par uh, with the standard uh, re resolution studies, parameter studies, right? So you increase the resolution by a factor of two, and if you see the effect reducing by a similar amount, that means it's all numerical diffusivity that is operating, right? Yeah. So, oh, so yeah. I, I have a difficulty understanding the, the principle of the thing. I understand that it might be present in some numerical simulations, but it's 
it's because of these uh, diffusive effects that creep in, right? Yeah. Even if you don't so, put them by hand. Yeah, no, okay. If you really want to think in terms of physical processes that can uh, diffuse, then you say, okay, uh, if you have your numerical, numerical simulation set up down to a length scale where, uh, where these things happen, then you see, then you'll see how, how, it, how, it, um, how the magnetic field change on that very small scale. But that doesn't make presumably not much difference for what happens on the larger scales. See if, if these, these fingers that we're developing, like in the, in the case of the solar prominence, on the length scales in the solar prominence of on the order of a kilometer or so, um, magnetic diffusion of some kind becomes important. Uh, it's only that the overall transport coefficients, the transport properties of this instability don't depend on it. So it could be reconnection. Uh, I mean, yeah, reconnection of or molecular um, diffusion processes, yes. But again, reconnection, yeah, depends <laughs> what, you, what you call reconnection, but certainly, yeah, that would definitely also be important. And that would be a fast process eh? uh, that sort of reconnects small scales real fast. Right, so yeah. in, in the sun, this, we know this happens, right? Uh, uh, but it, it has also observable effects. I mean, it raises the energy, there is ener energy released, right? Um, yeah. And this would have an effect in the disk as well, right? If it happens yeah. in significant amounts. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, essentially all of the gravitational energy that this gas release, um, uh, releases should show up somehow in the disk itself or in the magnetic field above it. Some of it could actually be propagating away as alpha in waves, who knows? But that's a good point. There should be that uh, signature of, uh, of the dissipation. Now, normally you would say, Oh, well, but that will just be like in, an, in a Shakura Symbiya disk. There we know what happens to the uh, uh, accretion energy that's being lost uh, into dissipated, dissipation. We we'll just heat up the disk. Okay. Uh, I think someone else wanted to ask a question uh, in parallel with Costas. Uh, can I ask a question, Vasily? Sure. Okay. Henk. Could you please go back to slide 10, number 10? Okay. Uh, right, that's the one. Okay. Um, I see that the, the just phenomenologically, the, the long period uh, stars are associated with small magnetic fields. Yeah. While low, uh, small period stars can have um, any kind of field, practically. Yeah. Okay. Is is can can is is there a way to understand that? The, 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 does it mean that that the uh, magnetic field, the flux was uh, lost in these uh, high period stars? Well. I guess that's, in, that's a question, yeah. If, if gamma equally happens to be a very old star, um, at some point, uh, ohmic diffusion will start happening. Uh, there's a bit of discussion about that, where that will happen. Uh, if, if at all, uh, the time scales are in the order of giga years, of a giga year or so. So you would start seeing that happening in an understandable way from the physics point of view. Uh, just when the stars move off the main sequence. But uh, if assuming that that's not the case here, um, it, it depends a bit on how you interpret this. Huh? Uh, this, this is extremely sparsely populated. Um, normally we call this just an ordinary field strength of 3000 Gauss or so, 2000, 3000 Gauss. But um, this reminds me that Gautier Matisse, uh, who has compiled, compiled these data, was interested in just this question. He wanted to know what happens here below. 
and uh, he, he applied for serving time for it and was rejected each case, <laughs> each time. But it would be nice to have more of them here to see if, if this really goes down. Okay. My eye sees an, an envelope starting you know, or, or a, a one over log, uh, yeah. log B, but that's probably my eye. I, I, I guess it's lack of lack of data. Yeah. Yeah. But, but and clearly, the, the box is not fully filled. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is also a, a, a curious. Um, I have no idea what it means that you have the highest field strength only at short periods. Okay. If there are no more questions, we would like to thank uh, Professor Spruit once more. And uh, the rest of us will meet again uh, next week at the same time.